as to the number of times Russ Pearson has graced our fellowship with his very special messages. And today is no different. I know Russ has a very personal story to share, with a twist. And I invite you to all to sit back, get comfortable, but first, please help me welcome Russ Pearson to our pulpit. Yes. I have a bag. I will share it soon. Let's see, I get to take my mask off, right? Yes. Well, um, it is a delight to be back. This is this is either my fourth or fifth time, Sally. I've kind of lost track of myself. I think it's twenty. But it feels like it. This, this feels like home in many, in many ways. Um, how many of you have never seen the likes of me ever in your life? <laughs> Very good. Well, i got to give you a little backstory. So, um, I, uh, I, I have, the first time I came, I introduced myself this way. I am a Christian. Ooh. I am an ordained minister, and I, wait for it, don't be afraid, <laughs> I'm an evangelical. That's how I introduced myself the first time I came. Um, and I've talked a lot about evangelicalism and some of what I've, I've seen in that regard over the, the last several years that, that I've been here. And I've got more to share about that, but it's still brewing within me, so that won't be today. Um, so many within the evangelical tribe that I've known for all my life, really, have embraced Christian nationalism, which I find really offensive and incredibly dangerous. Um, there is within uh, that tribe actually a, a real movement to deconstruct their faith. And, uh, also a, a corresponding uh, effort to reconstruct some sense of faith. So that's, that's happening within that, uh, within that broader group as well. So that's not what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> but when Judy and I were first discussing what I might speak on, Judy shared the October edition of the UU magazine, Soul Matters, and I found this there, and I quote, We have an interest in fairy tales this year especially those of the Grimm brothers. There's a darkness to the Grimm's versions of fairy tales that is said to arise from their desire to prepare children for a hard and threat-filled future. While our view of the future may not be that pessimistic, our times certainly call us to more complicated views than the Disney versions that promise everything will end happily ever after. This aligns well with this year's themes that invite us to explore the paths we need to lean into or reconsider to birth a new normal worthy of our hopes. Hence, my title today is just a, a bit of a pun, and that's why I'm calling it Grim with Two M's. I wonder who can just name, shout out the name of a, a Grimm's fairy tale that you re recall from your youth or any time. I suppose. Hansel and Gretel. I, what was that? Hansel and Gretel. Hansel and Gretel, yeah. Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood, absolutely. The Match Girl? The Match Girl? Three Little Pigs. What's that? Three Little Pigs. Three Little Pigs? Yeah, I think you're right. Any others? Cinderella. What was that? Cinderella. Cinderella, yeah. Really? Well, I want to talk to you just a little bit about Snow White for a moment. I don't think I heard anybody mention that, one, but uh, uh, anybody care to summarize that story in like 30 seconds or less? <laughs> I didn't think so. <laughs> well, here's Snow White according to Disney. <coughs> Threatened by her stepdaughter's beauty, a wicked stepmother orders a huntsman to take the young girl out into the woods and kill her. Kill her. Bringing back her heart. The huntsman can't do it and lets Snow White escape into the forest. She finds a tiny house where there are singing dwarves. dwarves, all named for their defining characteristics. They decide to let her stay to keep the house for them. Oh, oh, wow. Thank you. The wicked queen 
finds out via her magic mirror. mirror that Snow White isn't dead and sets out to kill her with a poisoned arrow. Yes. Though the dwarves get revenge by driving the queen off the edge of a cliff, they cannot wake Snow White until a passing and handsome prince, they're always handsome, I don't know why, <laughs> comes and wakes her with true love's kiss, and then they live happily ever after. Yes. But the grim version of that fairy tale goes something like this. There was no wicked stepmother. It was Snow White's real mother. <coughs> and she didn't just want Snow White's heart. She also wanted her lungs and her liver. When she discovers that the huntsman hasn't killed the girl, she sets out to try to kill her in three different ways. This is my favorite, number one. With a way too tight corset. <laughs> I'm not making this stuff up. Number two, with a poisoned comb. And number three, finally, a poisoned apple. 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 Yes. It's not a lover's kiss that awakens Snow White. It's a good shake as the prince runs off with Snow White's glass coffin. Apparently as he's running, he's shaking. He shakes it. And the queen doesn't get pushed off a cliff. You're going to love this too. She is forced to dance herself to death in a pair of red-hot iron shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we can all agree that the Grimm's were truly grim. <laughs> I titled this talk, well, let me just say, you know, in that you see things that there's, there's light, there's happy endings sometimes, or happy pieces of endings, there's dark, uh, there's unity, there's duality, there's all of these, all of these things, all these themes at play in the Grimm's fairy tales. And so I titled this talk, Faith, the grim truth with a twist. So let me begin to disclose the twist. My right, grocery bag. Three for three. <laughs> yes, that's a good idea. <laughs> this. I, if I had been thinking, Sally, I would have, I would have like emailed you my, my slides and we could have put them up. Yes. People could have actually seen these. <laughs> that, that is uh, my mother. Um, when she was much younger, <laughs> uh, and I was adopted by her. She actually was my grandmother, um, and I knew Margaret's mother as Carrie Ann Newell. That was my great-grandmother's name. And by the way, I remember my great-grandmother fondly. Uh, some of my earliest recollections are uh, her going to her house. She lived just a little ways away, almost a Hansel and Gretel type walk away. And uh, she would make me toast, usually on the dark side. <laughs> just, just a touch. But then with lots of homemade jam, which I delighted in as a, as a young boy. Um, but Carrie's husband had died long before I was born, and she had been married. And I actually really enjoyed her husband, too. His name was Leighton Newell, and my youngest son's middle name is now Leighton. That's how much I enjoyed Leighton. Uh, and after Carrie passed, which was in 1965, he continued to live, actually, in our home for a couple of years. So I got to know him pretty well. He was, uh, he would, play any time I wished, which I loved, uh, checkers with me, you know, that I'm like six, seven, eight years old. And uh, he didn't always let me win, but I certainly won, uh, what, win? I went, I went away. <laughs> I certainly won more than my fair share. And I think that he intentionally beat me on occasion, just so I understood that life wasn't always gonna be that easy. Light and dark. So, my adopted mother slash grandmother's maiden name was, in fact, 
Tun Tun Tun. Graham. Margaret Ann Graham. <laughs> Spelled just like the fairy tales. Now, I have no idea if there is any connection between the German Grimms of the 1800s, <laughs> Jacob and Wilhelm, who uh, were in fact the brothers behind the stories, but I want to tell you a small tale of how I find what I know about him to be instructive as we consider one of the lessons of Grimm's fairy tales, that light and dark are often bedfellows within our world, and sometimes even within us. So, his name was Eula, U-L-A-H, Eula M. Grimm. He was born in 1879. I looked him up in the 1940 census, and he never appears again. So apparently he died shortly thereafter. Um, at some point, he was born in Tennessee, but at some point he moved to Tacoma, Washington, which is where I was born and raised. Until I was 18, I moved to Eugene, Oregon. And so that is where, evidently, he met my great-grandmother. And by the way, Eula, uh, he, it appears that he is literally the first person, the first male at least, with that name, Eula, U-L-A-H is how he spelled it, first male with that name in America, which I found interesting. And uh, the, uh, the etymology of that name is, is sort of suspect, uh, a lot of folks feel that it has sort of a Hebrew sounding name, especially the way it's spelled, U-L-A-H. Uh, it also, when it's a feminine name, it's usually, usually E-U-L-A, sometimes with an H, and that literally means good words. But I don't know what U means when it's a masculine. That's beside the point anyway. So, uh, hold that thought. I've got another quote to show you. Great, huh? <laughs> what in the world is that? Why am I showing it to you? That's what's running through your head right yeah. now. Yeah, good. <laughs> well, I know. So, sorry. so that is the Asarco, which is an acronym that I'll describe. Uh, the Asarco plant in the Ruston neighborhood, right on the waterfront in Puget Sound, in Tacoma. In 1988, a guy by the name of Dennis Ryan constructed a smelter there on the tide flats in Ruston. Uh, in, in 1890, the smelter was acquired by a guy named William Rust. Evidently a humble man, Rust founded Ruston, the town, <laughs> as a company town for his employees right next to Tacoma, Washington, and it was incorporated as such. 1906. Are you with me so far? Okay. For the first five years of its operation, the smelter processed lead, which by itself isn't especially a, you know, a calming, wonderful thing to have in your atmosphere. In 1903, it expanded to include copper smelting. In 1905, Russ sold the plant to the American Smelting and Refining Company, hence a Sarko, a consortium of mines and smelters led by the Guggenheim family of New York. Hmm. Located on the Tide Flats adjacent to Commencement Bay in Puget Sound, by 1912, lead production had ended, and the company had converted the plant to a specialized custom copper smelter with a focus on inexpensive, low-grade copper ores that included a little ingredient I like to call arsenic. So the smokestack that was soon built dated to 1917. Considering at the time an engineering jam that was constructed of 2.5 million bricks, approximately 5,000 tons of mortar, and stood 571 feet tall, making it then the largest smokestack anywhere in the world that we knew about at the time. That photo is, in fact, a postcard <laughs> that was sold in the Tacoma environs in 1940 at the behest of the Chamber of Commerce because it represented such a marvelous 
commercial success. And everybody was so proud of their copper smelter. Asarco operated the smelter at the Ruston site until its closure in 1985. So I grew up, I was born in the very late, very, very late 50s. <laughs> very, so late. So I grew up with that plant in operation. It was a little ways away from the neighborhood I was in. But back then, we talked about the aroma of Tacoma. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it actually was that smelter that was still in operation until 1985. Uh, it had been, at various times, and it was then, one of Pierce County, which is the, the county Tacoma is in, one of its largest employers, and provided a, a good living wage to lots of Tacoma area residents. But there was, of course, that dark side. Uh, the employees were getting poisoned as they worked. Uh, there were lots of efforts to get the, uh, get the company Asarco to clean things up, and eventually they failed. So Asarco operated at the Ruston site until its closure in 1985. Uh, site of a strong union movement demanding safer work and less exposure to toxic chemicals. They fixed it by closing. The 67-acre Asarco smelter site was listed as one of the country's most polluted sites ever, with primary contaminants being, what do you suppose? Arsenic. Lead and arsenic, yeah. The Environmental Protection Agency, also known as the EPA, called for an eight-stage cleanup as one of the first Superfund sites in American history that included demolishing structures, excavating soil and slag in the most contam contaminated locations, disposing of the contaminants, plugging or removing surface water drainage, capping the project area, protecting the site from erosion, continuing monitoring impacts on groundwater and marine sediment, and an integrating cleanup with future land use plans. In January of 1993, the smokestack and a lot of the buildings that surrounded it were finally demolished. And I was not there that day, but I have seen pictures of people were lined up all up and down the waterway looking across at this smokestack and all of those buildings. And when it finally went up and came tumbling down, uh, there was a united cheer from everyone. They were so delighted that the aroma of Tacoma was finally being diminished. So that was 1993. It would take years of cleanup, years in court with a Sarco to finally get the company to pony up and do what they could to clean up the site. Today, well, and, and finally in 2008, so 15 years later, after they had cleared the area, 15 years later, finally, they felt it was safe enough to start constructing some things once again. I have I have a weird family tree, you already know that if I'm adopted by my grandmother. I have four siblings, I am the eldest. But one of my half-brothers still lives in Tacoma, and uh, I went and visited him, oh, it's been probably three years or so ago now, and we visited Ruston, and it really has been transformed into a beautiful area. It's right on the waterfront. Uh, how, we happen to be there on a beautiful summer day, a uh, nice breeze in the air. I couldn't smell any arsenic. I couldn't identify any lead that I was breathing in. It was beautiful. There were, uh, there were seabirds. People were fishing. People were kayaking. It was lovely. But it took all of those years to make it all go away. So, Eula Grimm, my great-grandfather by adoption, who died long before I was born, was dun, 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 a brick mason. That smokestack <coughs> was made of bricks. And the family lore, the way, the way that I learned this growing up was my great-grandfather had built that smokestack. And we were all so proud because we didn't know yet about all those bad things. Um, and of course, you know, it was a massive project. There was probably a fleet of masons, so 
but I learned somewhere along the way that he probably did not construct the 571 foot smokestack single handedly. Uh, so I wasn't quite as proud then, and then I had other reasons not to be as proud later in life. Uh, but he was a good man, he believed, doing a good deed to create employment for thousands of Tacoma residents for more than 65 years. There was a point of intense civic pride, I've already told you. That, literally, this photo was a postcard sold all across Tacoma to talk about, you know, how uh, Tacoma was ahead of the curve in terms of uh, civic pride and civic progress. All of that was there. But he was also unwittingly perhaps, but nonetheless, enabling the poisoning of the waterways, the land, the wildlife, the people. There is good and bad in life, the potential for good and bad in each of us. I was thinking about all of this uh, in terms of what I understand of some of the great wisdom teachings that we ascribed to in various ways, not, not necessarily us, but uh, across our planet. Uh, Buddhism talks about yin, yin, the yin and the yang. Uh, and you all know that symbol that suggests that there's this evolution. And even, even in the yin, there's a little bit of yang right there in that, that little center circle. And, and even in the yang, there's a little bit of yin. It's a, it's a constant evolution. It's just always kind of flowing. And, and both are always with us in terms of uh, Buddhism and their understanding. Uh, you know, the, the seasons, there's not just summer and winter, there's also fall and spring, those in-between, those, those liminal seasons of life. Judaism, the great Jewish prayer known as the Shema, uh, begins, Hear Israel, Adonai our God, Adonai is one. And yet, even in the Jewish scriptures, as, as, as uh, the book that, that uh, in the Christian context we call Genesis, even as it begins and talks about you know, dividing the, the night from the day and the light from the darkness and the earth from the sea. So there's those, there's those dualities, in, in, even in the, the unity of, of God, as is, is, uh, is by Judaism. And there's an interesting passage in the Torah in, in Exodus where Moses, or Moshe, uh, longs to meet God literally face to face. And the way the story goes, God hides Moses in the cleft of a rock, a shadow place, and passes by, showing only his backside to Moses. Light, dark, duality, and then the unity. In Christianity, which has a evangelicalish person, I certainly know well. Uh, there is a Christmas carol that Christians sing referencing the belief that a baby born in a manger somehow represents and embodies the one God, the little town of Bethlehem. Uh, in your dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Dark light, hopes, Fears, a duality, yet a unity. Alexander Solzhenitsyn uh, in the Gulag Archipelago writes these interesting words. If only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere, insidiously committing evil deeds, and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being, and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart? There's a story I have heard many times, and I suspect you have too, and it's applied to various things, and it, it goes something like this in the casual telling. A Native American grandfather was talking to his grandson about how the evil we find in this world can also sometimes be found within us. And he says to his grandson, I feel as if I have two wolves fighting in my heart. One is vengeful, angry, violent. The other wolf is loving, forgiving, compassionate. And the grandson asks, 
grandfather, which wolf will win the fight? And what's the answer? The one that I feed. The one that I feed. As I think about my convoluted family tree, the birth parents I never knew well, the grandparents who adopted me, the great grandmother who literally fed me some of the earliest breakfasts I remember, and the great grandfather I never met, and the complicated legacy he left embodied in a smokestack. As I think about my somehow being connected to the Grimm legacy in this weird way, and the lessons of those dark stories by the German Grimms. As I think about Halloween's soon arrival, I am also reminded of Dia de los Muertos, the Mexican Day of the Dead, brought to life not many years ago by another Disney treatment. Anybody remember the name of the movie? Coco. Coco, yes. <laughs> And two quotes from that film have uh, stuck with me since I saw it. I, I actually loved it a lot. One is, if there's no one left in the living world to remember you, you disappear from this world. But you can change that. And the second quote, if there's, uh, speaking of an evil forefather, Coco is reminded, you don't have to forgive him, but we shouldn't forget him. We are complex and complicated creatures, sprinkling good and bad across our individual timelines. It is inevitable that our personal legacies will contain both. But I hope you will join me in a commitment to endeavoring to feed that loving, forgiving, compassionate wolf that lives within us. Amen. Amen. special music that he would like to play and we would like you to enjoy as we lower the lights, whoever can get the light switch in the back will be appreciated. And let's uh, get quiet where you are, let the music surround you, enjoy the children in the back room <laughs> as they pierce our eardrums and our consciousness. So just enjoy the music from Tuvia and reflect on what Russ has provided us today.
Thank you, Julia. Okay. So the month of October, we we're taking an offering for our friends at the Florence Habitat for Humanity. We also are taking a collection, as we do every week, for our particular fellowship. We are lay-led. The monies that you contribute go right to the bottom line um, and pay for our necessary expenses. And we really, really appreciate your contributions to us. So there's one basket I'm going to pass around. And the basket has a logo of the Habitat for Humanity on one side and Florence Union Fellowship on the other. And I'm going to ask Natasha if you would help just instruct it and get it going back and forth. And Catherine, would you do the same over here? As we begin, I ask that you repeat after me. Divine love through me. Divine love through me. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. Blesses and multiplies all that I am. All that I give. All that I give. And all that I receive. All that I receive. I am prosperous now. I am prosperous now. Blessed be. Blessed be. As the basket is being passed among you, if you are unable to make a contribution, that's fine. Just pass the basket next to the person next to you with uh, loving, tender care. And for those of you listening to our recording, you can certainly send us a check if you'd like and mail it to P.O. Box 2502, Florence 97439. And anyone can visit our website and make a contribution on the, through the donate button. So we appreciate that. So now we've got some announcements. I'm going to share with you just a few things from the program. First off, we have a special meeting of our members, uh, including those six that were just in introduced a few weeks ago. You're invited to stay after service, about 15 minutes after service. We're going to have a quick uh, meeting of the members. Blessing of Animals with Deborah Larson, spelled L-A-R-S-O-N, not S-E-N. Sorry, Deborah. You didn't even notice. Good. We've got hiking coming up on the 26th and on the 2nd of November. We've got game night on the 29th. And our next Sunday service on the 30th will be with our own Nin Babo. And the title of it is the, um, the Beyond the Is it Lifting the Veil or Beyond the Veil? Lifting the Veil. Lifting the veil. So join us ne next week for uh, Nin's talk on Lifting the Veil. No. Two. Two, weeks. Two weeks. Sorry. No. Just somebody wake me up. <laughs> next week, Blessing of Animals. Do you want to say something about this right now, please? Anything you want to share? Have you got all the photographs you need on the animals you're going to share with? We've got animals, pet photos, and there'll be treats for you to take home for your animals. So she's going to have a slideshow, she's going to have treats for your animals, and Deborah does. This is probably one of the most highly anticipated Sunday services we have for blessing of the animals. Or blessing of animals? The blessing of animals. The blessing of animals. We're not going to bring them here live. It's just we're big like that. We're going to be, they're going to, yes. Okay. So, uh, anybody else have an announcement? Come on forward, talk into the microphone, and let's hear what you have to say. Uh, and while you're coming up here, for those who are here for the first time and you've not done so, we do have a guest registry. I've got several clipboards. If you'd like to get information about us, we send out a newsletter once a week. We'd love to keep you informed about upcoming services and what we're doing. So, there's clipboards on the back the table. Please. Uh, avail yourself of that. Notice how I got the word veil in there again? <laughs> I know. Judy! Okay. Good news. Last time I'm doing this. Um, so, <laughs> I know. Yay! Yay. And, and also attempting to hit your guilds button just a little bit. So these are the packets of 20 letters each that you would complete and they'll be sent out in about a week and a half to voters who don't always vote, just encouraging them to vote. Not who to vote for, not how to vote, just simply please, please, please vote. We are pushing 43, 4,400 letters Ooh. completed and ready to go. Right we would now. love to get, yes, we would love to get to 45 or 46. So this would be the last time I'll ask you. I'll have them in the back. You just take one. Directions are pretty obvious. And um, just help us get folks out there. This is, as every election always is, the most important one of our lifetimes, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> So as that basket keeps going around, we're going to continue with some announcements, okay? I'd like to invite you to come to Awaken to Joy with Creation Mandalas for Unity this coming Saturday here in our beautiful new cafe. We will be doing an artist meditation um, morning, 10.30 to 12.30, and you do not have to be an artist to attend. 
It's a meditation using art and drawing in circles, which is all about unity and wholeness. It's really fun, it's really enlightening and relaxing, and most people say they find a lot of peace and freedom. If you'd like to have a, a flyer, you can see me afterwards. I'd love to have you. And that's coming up what day? This coming Saturday. This Saturday. The 22nd. Okay. We'll have a meeting last one more time. Yes, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Ryan, did you have something you wanted to share? Um, no. Okay. Indian and I are fairly <coughs> well, Randall. Um, but we have a tradition, and I guess I'm just putting it out there as a, uh, we typically fly home to North Carolina for Thanksgiving, and so we're kind of looking for a, a pet sitter. Uh, now, there's a hundred ways to do it. Is it dog are, or cat? That's a cat. It's a cat. And um, we, we're RV people, so we can put the rig anywhere you want. <laughs> um, Washburn or anywhere, but the thing is, is that if a person did not want to actually hang out at the RV, that's fine. If you think that'd be fun, that'd be fun too. But uh, or a, or a boarding facility, if somebody wants to recommend one. But we just don't know what to do yet. We need to kind of like get on with it. Okay. We thought we'd appeal to you all just in case somebody wants to live in an RV or watch my couch. <laughs> <laughs> Can they just come once or twice a day yeah, to play yeah, with the cat yeah, and uh -huh. still go home? No, okay, so read, see read, Randall. Read to him. Read to him. What's that? Read, read to him. Read to him. <laughs> right. <laughs> Jennifer, we need to read to our cats. Grim's <laughs> <laughs> fairy tales. Grim's yeah. fairy tales. So uh, I'm not following where the basket is. Oh, you have it right there. Uh, is there any other announcements to share? If you want to invite the children back in? Jane, would you open the door to the end? Let those, let those rascals back in here as we, as we conclude. So, Deborah? Yeah. Sorry, I do that. When I sit together, it just drives me crazy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Just sorry. I, all I want to say is um, we thank you for your spiritual practice of giving and understanding me. Uh, your contributions are received in real grateful appreciation. We got the kids coming in. Would you like to help extinguish the chalice? We extinguish the chalice with these words from Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, and most of all, be loving. So if you've had your phone on airplane mode or on mute, you're welcome to release it to the world. We're going to close our, our service today with our peace song. We invite you to rise as you are able. We're going to form a big circle around the chairs and the podium. And we're going to sing our peace song. The words are on the back if you're not familiar with it. If you want to just